an army sergeant had to break up a fight between two of the infantrymen, and he separated them. And in his frustration, he went and called his superior officer, the colonel, and he said, Colonel, I have met the enemy, and he is us. <laughs> Sometimes we are our own worst enemy. Sometimes we're the ones that bring the most trouble on ourselves. And we bring the most trouble on ourselves when we turn away from God, when we don't do what God has us to do. So what we're going to find out in Joshua chapter 7, God told Israel that he was going to give them the promised land, but the indication and implication is that they have to do things his way. They have to respect the Torah, respect the law of God. Let's find out what happens when they don't do it that way. <clears throat> Joshua 7. They've already overcome in Jericho, and Jericho was considered to be the toughest part of the military campaign. But when you go against what God says, everything is tough in life. Joshua 7, Achan's sin. But right in the end of verse 20, at the end of chapter 6, verse 27, it says the Lord was with Joshua, but chapter 7, but that's when you know there's going to be trouble. The Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Remember, everything was to be devoted to the Lord. Everything that was used in idol worship, everything that was part of that pagan culture, either had to be completely destroyed or given over to the Lord. Verse 2, Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is about to the west and a little bit north of Jericho in the middle of Israel. Real rocky area, dusty, sandy, which is near beth -Avon to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, you know, this is going to be a piece of cake, man. <laughs> Not everyone's going to have to go up to Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and don't weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. You know, when the Packers played the Lions, they already had the division and home field advantage throughout the playoffs wrapped up. They didn't play all their starters the whole game. Uh, that's kind of how Israel's doing this. We don't need to break out all of our starters. <laughs> this is going to be this is going to be a cakewalk. Don't weary the whole army. Only a few people live in AI. Verse 4, so about 3,000 went up, and there was a major upset. They were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. Remember I talked about dusty, sandy, and, they, and there it is, the stone quarries. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. You know, what an upset. Israel was the undefeated upstart coming into the promised land with the blessing of God. And this little two-bit town defeats them in battle and kills 36 people. I, I'm reminded of the story of the horse Man of War in, I think, 1919, 1920. The most, the fastest horse in the world. Nobody could beat him. He won 19 races in a row, which was unheard of, still unheard of. We think it's a big deal to win the Triple Crown. He won 19. But then he was going for 20, and he lost the race. And no one expected him to lose. And you know the name of the horse that beat Man of War? It was called Upset. And that became part of the American lexicon, that when you lose something that you weren't expected to lose, it's an upset. This was a major upset. In fact, verse 6, Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. He was totally not anticipating this. 
the elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And then listen to Joshua's prayer. You can tell he doesn't know. You can tell he doesn't get it. Allah, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan, like Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Pardon your servant, Lord, but what can I say? Now that Israel's been routed by its enemies, the Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this. They'll surround us and wipe us out. What then shall you do about your great name? You know, why have you turned your back on us? What are you going to do to vindicate yourself? And then verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, get up. <laughs> Why are you, what are you doing down on your face? You know, this isn't about me abandoning you. It's about you guys abandoning me. It's not about my lack of faithfulness. It's about your lack of faithfulness. Verse 11, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That's why the Israelites can't stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they've been liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. You know, it even says in Leviticus in a number of places, especially I think in Leviticus chapter 27 that if you dedicate a house to the lord and then change your mind and redeem it you got to add 20 percent to the value when you dedicate a field to the lord and then you decide you want to redeem it you got to add 20 percent to that value and so forth so these were things that were devoted to the lord and we're going to find out that Achan didn't do it the right way he didn't well he it would have been wrong to take it anyway he stole it without the intention of giving anything and we'll get into what why he would have considered to do such a thing in just a little bit but verse 13 god tells joshua go consecrate the people tell them consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow for this is what the lord the god of israel says there are devoted things among you israel you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them Present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord chooses shall come before me clan by clan. The clan the Lord chooses shall come before come forward family by family. And the family the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. Whoever is caught with the devoted thing shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to him. You know, if I'm aching, I'm quaking in my boots right now. Oh, wait, I don't have boots. I'm quaking in my sandals right now. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Verse 16, early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes, and Judah was chosen. You know, Judah is the king of the tribes. Jesus is coming out of the tribe of Judah. Verse 17, the clans of Judah came forward, and the Zerahites were chosen. He had the clan of the Zerahites come forward by families, and Zimri was chosen. Chosen. Joshua had his family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. You know, this reminds me of the sentencing of the three men who killed Ahmad Arbery. The first person stood up, and they said, we, the jury, find the defendant, whatever his name was, guilty of the crime of conspiracy to commit murder. And then they went through all nine charges. And I think he was guilty of eight out of the nine charges. And then the second man stood up and they said, we, the jury, find the defendant, whatever his name is, guilty of blah, blah, blah. And he was guilty of seven of the nine charges. And by the time the third man stood up, he was already crying. He knew the hammer of God was about to fall. He knew the judgment of God was about to come down on him. 
And that had to have been so hard, hearing the judgment and seeing the judgment of God fall on those first two men, knowing you're about to get it. And that's exactly the situation here. Achan knows he's about to get it. Verse 19, then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. That's like a swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Verse 20, Achan replied, it's true. I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I've done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them. He's admitting he broke the 10th commandment. And by the way, when you break the 10th commandment, you're also breaking the first commandment because whenever you covet something, you're making an idol out of it and you shall have no other gods before me, God says. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. And one of the things that strikes me about this is how torn up Achan was about his sin. But notice, if you don't mind, he wasn't torn up about his sin until after his sin was exposed to the community. May God help us to be torn up about the idea of sin before we commit the sin. Because when we see something for what it really is, a sin against God, it should hopefully make it so that we don't want to do it to begin with. Now we worship a God who is gracious and merciful and he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and, and we can experience grace and mercy and forgiveness. But too often we have neglected to have a holy view of God and a holy hatred of sin ahead of time like we should. Verse 22, Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was hidden in his tent, the silver underneath, the Babylonian robe and the gold. You know, what, what could have been going through Achan's mind? You know, maybe he was thinking, you know, I would look good in this robe, man. People are going to say, Achan, you look sharp today. And the gold bar, 50 shekels, you know, you, it would take more than a lifetime to earn that much. Aiken's probably thinking, who's going to notice? Who's going to tell? Who's going to care? Just taking this gold bar of, and then 200 shekels silver bar, we're going to be set for life and nobody's going to be the worse for wear. It's not like we're committing a federal offense. And it's going to help our families. Doesn't God want us to help our families? I mean, this is the kind of reasoning that Achan may have done. But what Achan didn't realize is that his selfishness brought sin and disobedience into the camp of Israel. Just like Adam and Eve's sin brought sin and disobedience and consequences to the entire human race. Achan's doing something similar to Israel, and there are consequences. There was death in the Garden of Eden. And we no longer were meant to live forever. We would, there'd be a limit to life. And same thing with Achan's life. And same thing with the immediate consequences. 36 people died because of Achan's selfishness. And you've also got to implicate his family. How could you bring all that stuff into the camp and your people in your own tent don't even know you're doing it. So they were giving aid and comfort to Achan, thinking it's okay for you to bring the sin into the community. Verse 23, they took the things from Achan's tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons, daughters, cattle, donkeys, and sheep, his tent, and all that he had, to the valley of Achor. And Achor sounds similar to the name Achan. 
Achor means trouble. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? Why have you brought this Achor on us in the valley of Achor? The Lord will bring Achor on you today. The Lord will bring trouble on you, just as you brought trouble on us. Then all Israel stoned him to death. It doesn't specifically say that they stoned his family to death, although they were probably accessories to the crime by knowing about it and not saying anything about it. All Israel stoned him, and after they stoned the rest, they burned them. I'll take that back. Apparently they did stone the rest of the family and then burn them. You know, originally God said, whoever is guilty of this shall be destroyed. They shall be burned by fire. Apparently it was more merciful to stone them first and then burn them. I I would think. Verse 26, over Achan, they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. But yeah, I never thought of that before, that this is almost like a repeat of the Garden of Eden story, where just as one person brought trouble to the human race, one person in Israel, Achan, brought trouble for the nation of Israel. And we have to realize that sometimes the bad choices we make not only affect us, they affect other people. That's certainly the theme in First and Second Kings. Leaders that do what is right in the eyes of the Lord bring blessing, and those who do evil bring burden and punishment. And so may God help us to hate sin and hate stealing and hate coveting before we get around to thinking about doing it. May God change our hearts so that not only do we love the Lord, but that we love what he loves and hate what he hates. Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Give your life to Christ and he'll give his life for you. Confess your sins to Christ and instead of being pelted with rocks and burned with fire, Jesus took that punishment for you on the cross. He'll give you his forgiveness and salvation. It's the only way. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll be back tomorrow with Joshua chapter 8. Bye for now.